Good evening and welcome to Current Issues. I'm your host, Hisham Tilawi. Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we are going to start with a tragic story out of the West Bank in Palestine. A bus accident, a school bus accident this morning took the lives of at least 10 school children between the ages of four and six in a tragic road accident. The roads in the West Bank, unfortunately, they are not the standards that we uh, are familiar with here in the United States because of the Israeli military occupation and because of the, the Palestinians and their resources do not have the kind of resources that we have in the West. And due to the uh, uh, occupation, the roads in, the, in uh, the West Bank, they are not to uh, standards, up to standards. And uh, therefore, you know, this is, it's, it's a tragic accident, but the reason for this tragic accident is the shape of the roads in the West Bank. And uh, so our condolences go out to the families of those children. You know, sometimes we take life for granted. You kiss your children goodbye in the morning, go on, on a field trip from Jerusalem to the West Bank to Ramallah, and they don't come back. That's the tragedy of life. And unfortunately, it happened today. It makes us wonder about life and how much is it really worth. Let's just ponder that. The second story that we are going to talk about tonight is the Ron Paul. And is the GOP cheating him? Are they trying to cheat him of some votes in some of these states that are having caucuses. We will be talking about Maine in particular, where the GOP leadership in that state actually, probably most likely have cheated Ron Paul on some votes and therefore Mitt Romney won that state, even though in actuality, if they did not do what they have done, Ron Paul would have probably won that state. So even within the GOP, it's not just the media that is fighting Ron Paul. It is also his own party that is fighting Ron Paul. And I guarantee you, if Ron Paul is on the ticket, on the GOP ticket, Ron Paul will win. You know, people from around the world have actually voted for their favorite American president or candidate in the GOP lineup. The votes would surprise you. Actually, we did have uh, some pictures, but we uh, unfortunately, those pictures did not work to show you the result of people around the, uh, the world voting for the GOP candidate. 93% of people around the world voted for Ron Paul. And the rest of them, all three of them, got 7% total between three of them. Gingrich, I think, got less than half percent, where uh, I think uh, Mitt Romney has gotten like 3% and the other guy got 3% or something like that. But divide the seven between them, it doesn't matter. So if the, people, if the people in the world know who the best man for the country, don't you think you deserve as an American citizen, don't you think you deserve to know who the best man for this country? But the problem is we don't really know what reality is. We don't know if this world that we are living in, uh, this country that we live in, and we go and vote for presidential candidates, and we put presidents in, and we put congressmen in, we don't know if that's really for real or just a show. 
Because definitely it's not for real. And definitely you are not voting for real. It's a play. You are an actor in this play. There's nothing about reality in our political system, period. Everything is a lie. Everything is a cheat. Everything is the way they design it, what they want it to be, and it will be. The power of money talks. You know, we have heard our president, and this is the main topic of tonight's program. We have heard our president, and yes, president, talking about Al-Qaeda and that we are at war with Al-Qaeda. And sometimes you, you, know, you wonder, what was this Al-Qaeda all about? What is Bin Laden all about? What is this Ayman al-Zawahiri that they got us his video last week? What is he all about? Who are these people? Where do they live? Where do they come from? Al-Qaeda, now mind you, that it did not even exist if we did not create it, if the United States did not create it. Now this particular picture and people who were close to when that picture was taken will tell you that these people, they were in for the picture and most of them decided they want to cover their faces because this was a photo op when Bin Laden this thing was probably the sitting, and that's the only picture you see for bin Laden with his military. Now, we do have information that suggests that this picture was actually taken by design. Actually, it was a little video that most of you saw for like a less than a minute video. But this particular picture was taken by design to show that Bin Laden has people with arms around him and they all in camouflage, even though those were given to them before the picture and most of them decided that if we're going to take this picture and be in this video, we want to cover our faces. Just think about it. If this man was between his people and in his army, do you think that his people want to be covering their faces like that? No. Because these people did not want to be in that picture with Bin Laden with their faces. Because that picture has been used and used and used to drill in your head a reality that was not there, a perception that was not there. And that is the difference between reality and perception. And when enough people have the same perception, then that perception becomes a reality. Al-Qaeda. Osama, uh, Obama, Osama bin Laden and Obama bin Laden, just a few months ago, now they changed it from we are at war with the terrorists, and this is war on terror, to we are at war with Al-Qaeda. You remember Obama when he said it was in a State of the Union address, uh, uh, address, not the uh, one, not the last one, but the one before when he said that we are at war with Al-Qaeda. He said that. Now, Imagine the United States with all its might and all its power and very much controlling the countries around the world. Imagine they can't get rid of this thing called Al-Qaeda. Imagine we are still at war with Al-Qaeda. Our director of intelligence, a guy named Mike... Uh, Crapper, I think, or something like that. I actually, uh, well, he's our director of intelligence, told the 
a Senate hearing that Al-Qaeda from Iraq is responsible for bombings in Syria last week. So our own director of intelligence, this is the guy that supposedly knows everything. You know, we have a picture of this guy, I just forgot his name. So if this guy says, if our director of intelligence, yes, that's him. If he thinks that Al-Qaeda is responsible for killings in Syria, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and he said that Al-Qaeda in Iraq actually has the largest group of all Al-Qaeda affiliates throughout the Middle East. So it is the center of power for this thing that is called Al-Qaeda is in Iraq. Now this is what our own director of intelligence just told us last week that Al-Qaeda in Iraq is moving hundreds of people, hundreds of fighters into Syria to commit these atrocities against the Syrian people. This is coming from our own director of intelligence. Now, ladies and gentlemen, think about this. He's telling us that Al-Qaeda in Iraq is the largest group of Al-Qaeda anywhere around the world because our chief of staff told us last year that there were less than a hundred Al-Qaeda members in Afghanistan. Just divide how many people we have fighting in Afghanistan, about what, 130, 140,000? And there are less than 100 Al-Qaeda members in Afghanistan. And that's where Al-Qaeda was supposed to have been. Now we are told that the largest Al-Qaeda concentration and their power is in Iraq. Now didn't it, President Bush said that mission accomplished when he attacked Iraq and a few months after that? Didn't it Obama pull the troops out of Iraq because we accomplished our mission in Iraq? There was not a single Al-Qaeda member in Iraq before we attacked, and now it's the strongest, the largest? Does that make sense? Does that make sense coming out of our own director of intelligence? Does that make sense? We go, we destroy a country, we kill a million people there in Iraq because we are fighting Al-Qaeda. There was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq, none whatsoever, because they were at odds with Saddam Hussein. They did not like each other. And now Al-Qaeda has largest group that is influential enough, that is strong enough to actually go between countries and commit bombings in Syria? And that's coming from our own director of intelligence. I want you to see this uh, first video that talks a little bit about uh, the, uh, uh, the Al-Qaeda and where are they coming from. Let's play. On Sunday, al-Qaeda head Ayman al-Zawahiri urged militants from neighboring countries to join the fight against Syria's Bashar al-Assad. In a video, Zawahiri said protesters should not rely on the West, Turkey, or the Arab League. Instead, he urges Muslims to aid Syrians any way they can in toppling the Assad regime. It's the latest attempt by al-Qaeda to insert itself into Arab Spring conflicts, but McClatchy Newspapers reports it's not just idle talk. U.S. officials told McClatchy al-Qaeda has already carried out attacks in Syria. The Iraqi branch of al-Qaeda carried out two recent bombings in the Syrian capital, Damascus, and likely was behind suicide bombings Friday that killed at least 28 people in the largest city, Aleppo. An Iraqi official told the Associated Press that militants are already moving across the border to Syria. CNN points out these new revelations are playing right into the Assad regime's story. The Syrian government has consistently argued since the beginning of this uprising nearly 11 months ago that it is fighting armed terrorists linked to al-Qaeda. 
Reports from Syria have shown anti-Assad protesters becoming increasingly militarized. There are reports of protesters fighting the Syrian army using tactics much like al-Qaeda in Iraq used against U.S. forces. A BBC correspondent says these new reports will make any international response to the Syria crisis much more difficult. There have already been reports of Islamic militants crossing into Syria from Iraq. If violent Islamic extremists are becoming increasingly involved, it is going to muddy the waters of an already very complex situation. On Sunday, the Arab League proposed a joint peacekeeping mission with the UN. At the same meeting, the head of the League's observer mission in Okay. The funny thing, what our director of intelligence also said, that some of these groups in Syria have been infiltrated by al-Qaeda members coming from Iraq. And he even added that they even don't know that these groups that have been infiltrated, they even don't know that they have been infiltrated by al-Qaeda. But yet our director of intelligence knows that they have been infiltrated by al-Qaeda and they don't even know it. So how is that? Who's directing al-Qaeda? Is the CIA directing al-Qaeda? Is the CIA, is the CIA an arm of the United States government and Al-Qaeda as an arm of, a, of the CIA? Or is the CIA and Al-Qaeda one and the same and an arm of the United States defense forces or offense forces, whatever you want to call it? Because there's no other explanation, ladies and gentlemen. There is no other explanations. We know for a fact that CIA teams go into all of these countries to instigate the trouble that those countries go through. We know they were in Libya. We know they were in Egypt. We know they were in Tunisia. We know they are in Yemen. We know they are in Syria. So how could CIA teams be working in the same place where Al-Qaeda is working? How come we spend trillions of dollars? Now, these, this particular picture is for supposedly Al-Qaeda members in Yemen. Now, let me tell you something about it. These people that you're looking at were in prison at the Guantanamo Bay prison. For six years, they were in the United States custody. In 2007, they were released to the Saudi Arabian because they are Saudi Arabians. They were released to the Saudi Arabian government who put them in prison for another year. They got out in 2008. In 2009, they surfaced in Yemen leading Al-Qaeda in Yemen. So apparently, wherever we need Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda will be there. Al-Qaeda is the arm that the United States is using to instigate trouble around the world. Yes. Now, how complicated is that for you to understand? It is very complicated for you to understand, and it is complicated for people in the Middle East to understand. How could the CIA actually recruit Muslims who want to fight the United States? How could that happen? And you're telling us they are directed by the United States? Yes. The United States is, well, the foreign policy of the United States is a Zionist foreign policy. It's not United States foreign policy. It's Israel's foreign policy. Israel, as you have seen, if you've been watching us here, you know they are responsible for 9-11, and we proved that over and over and over again, that Israel is responsible for 9-11. Israel is responsible for everything out there that is going on in the Middle East by using the United States, by using the media in the United States, by using the military of the United States, Israel and the assets like the CIA. Israel is able to accomplish all that. How they do it? Very simple. 
How many Muslims, young Muslims, do you think you can go out there and recruit to fight the United States in these Muslim countries? How many? Now, imagine if the Soviet Union or China came over here and attacked the United States and killed a million Americans, and it's still killing Americans. Are you going to have a hard time finding and recruiting Americans to fight the Chinese or the Russians? Of course not. You have the United States attacked and killed people in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, all over the Middle East, in Kuwait. Do you think you're going to find, and also, don't forget that the United States hegemony over that area also does not please these young Muslims who want to be free of imperialism. So do you think you're going to have a hard time recruiting people for Al-Qaeda? Of course not. Just tell them, come fight. Come fight so you can go to heaven killing the invaders? Do you think you're going to have a hard time? No, you're not. That's how they get these young men to fight in what they think is Al-Qaeda, and it's nothing but a CIA operation. A CIA operation, they use it whenever they want to. Yes. Um, you know, we're going to play another video with uh, Michael Shora. He was the, uh, Michael was the head of the CIA bin Laden unit. He was hunting bin Laden, thinking that there was a bin Laden to hunt. You know, unfortunately, the head of the bin Laden unit find out, found out the hard way that there was no bin Laden to, uh, to hunt. Let's listen to him and talking about Al-Qaeda. We're sitting down with Michael Scheuer, the man who had served in the CIA for more than 20 years, up until 2004. At one time, he was the chief of the CIA bin Laden unit. Then he went and exposed how counter-effective Washington's methods were in the fight against terror. He looked at the U.S. through its enemy's eyes. In fact, it's the title of one of his books called uh, Through Our Enemy's Eyes. I'm very pleased to have the chance to interview you. Thank Mr. you. Schoenier. I'm glad to be here. Bin Laden is gone. Who is Washington's number one enemy now? Washington's enemy is an enemy that doesn't exist. We're fighting an, uh, an Islamic enemy that uh, Washington believes is out to kill us because we have elections, because we're free, because we have women in the workplace. It's an enemy that doesn't exist. It didn't exist when bin Laden was alive. It doesn't exist now. America is being attacked because of its foreign policy in the, in the Muslim world, because of its support for Israel, because of its support for the Saudi police state, because of its presence on the Arab Peninsula. And until we accept that, until Americans can say to each other, whether you support aid to Israel or not, our relationship with Israel is causing this war, we are not going to be able to, to, to defeat this enemy. And Israel itself, as a country, is not the problem. The real problem are, is the leaders of the Jewish American community in the United States who influence and corrupt our Congress to support Israel when we have no interest there. You imply that it, it, the Israeli lobby is dragging the United States into the wars, into absolutely. the conflict? They're absolutely dragging us in. Iraq was a war that was pr pr proffered or was called for mainly. Well, let me ask you this. Yeah. The situation in the region, in the wake of all these revolutions in the Middle East and North Africa, yes. you can pretty much describe it as turmoil. Turmoil is no good for Israel. What you're saying? Well, the, the, the American political establishment is caught between two things. They're extremely pro-Israel, and they're almost Marxist in their belief that democracy and the spread of democracy is inevitable in all places, in all peoples, at all times. And so they need to protect the Israelis, but they can't say what is a reality. For example, there is not going to be a democracy in Tunisia. 
or, 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 or Libya or Egypt that in any way resembles democracy in the West. And yet they, what they've done is create anarchy. They've created a situation where the only beneficiaries are the Islamists. The guns that have flown out of Egypt, out of Tunisia, out of Libya to the Islamists have been enormous in their volume. And the prisons that were opened in Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya have reinforced the Islamist groups across the world. So uh, their, their mindless, their mindless uh, pursuit of secular democracy at the end of the day endangers the stability of the region and probably the whole world. Are you saying we're going to see further radicalization of the region? Oh, especially in Africa. Yes, ma'am. The guns that are flowing out of the three places where there were Arab Spring revolts are going to cause problems in Somalia, across North Africa, and in Nigeria. Let's talk about Syria. Yes. Syria says the earth will start shaking if anyone intervenes in their internal affairs. How badly does the U.S. Uh, is the U.S. trying to interfere? Oh, I think we're, we're interfering uh, unconscionably. Uh, until they removed the U.S. ambassador, he was running around the country trying to encourage groups to overthrow the Syrian government. That is not the role of any diplomat, United States or Russian or Chinese or British. Uh, we have um, really very cold-bloodedly urged Syrians to get out on the street knowing that they're going to get shot down by their government. Uh, again, Syria is a country where there is no U.S. interest. Since I was a little boy, we've been afraid of the Syrians. And if you look at the map, it's hard to imagine that little blot of country called Syria could be a threat to the United States. We're sitting down with Michael Short. Okay, well... So, um, you can see that what is the United States foreign policy is, it has nothing to do with the interest of the United States. The reality is we are over there doing the dirty work of a country that has influence over our politicians here. Because the only way, the only way our politicians can actually win an election is if they sign up and say that, hey, look, we will protect the, uh, 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 we will protect Israel, and we will do everything possible to make Israel a superpower in that region and around the world. Because that's exactly what this whole thing is all about. So it's okay even though we are shooting ourselves in the foot. But you know what? When we started this program about 10 years ago, many people around the United States did not understand these things. But now many people, especially the young ones, the ones who go on the internet, the ones who don't just sit in front of a TV, in front of Fox Network. Speaking of Fox, Fox Network is probably, it's not just Fox, all of them, all of them have been influenced and controlled by these Zionists and their money. All you have to do is just look at the money, follow the money and see where the money is going. There was only one host on Fox Network that started to actually understand what is going on and started feeding it a little bit at a time into the public. Well, they took him off because he went too far. And that was Judge Napolitano. Most of you are familiar with him. Now, Judge Napolitano, he understood that 9-11 the story the government has given us is not a true story. Now, this is a judge. He sat on the Superior Court, the youngest judge to sit on the Superior Court of New Jersey. He understood, and he started talking about it. They did not like that. And then, the one that really done him is the next video that you are going to see with the same Michael Scheuer, the person, the CIA intelligence chief, the CIA chief of the Hunt Bin Laden unit. 
let's go to Judge Napolitano. DOJ's announcement of the foiled Iranian terror plot on the Saudi Arabian ambassador to the U.S. comes at a time, as we were just discussing, when Eric Holder has been subpoenaed for the Fast and Furious operation, a scandalous uh, event that put U.S. firearms, military-grade weapons, in the hands of Mexican drug cartels. So what can we make of all this? For big-picture analysis, we also turn to former CIA operative and chief of the bin Laden unit, Michael Shore. Michael, it's always a pleasure. Uh, welcome back to Freedom Watch. Thank you, Judge. Uh, well, why do you think uh, the Attorney General is hyping this so-called threat from Iran? Why do you think it was announced when it was announced? And does any of this make sense to you? Well, I think, first of all, uh, Ms. Miller's description of the operation is, is correct. It's like a Marx Brothers movie, but without the Marx Brothers, just some dummies they, they recruit from the street. Uh, I, I think uh, one thing that you need to keep in mind is that the performance of the FBI and DOJ in the area of terrorism has been pretty pathetic over the past couple years. They may have jumped at something because it gave an appearance of, of, of actually uh, being successful, but really, it, it turns out to be just another sting, Judge. Uh, this is another, another uh, uh, counterterrorism operation at the end of the day that lured somebody into running it, apparently. All right, this, so is, I, this is basically uh, a claim by the federal government that it protected us from harm that was never really there and never really threatening us to begin with. But, but well, yet it, has that, it has that added twist, Michael, of involving the, the government of Iran. So let me ask you this, who would want to create the impression that we need to engage in military activity, which a lot of the neocons demanded be before the ink was even dry on this criminal complaint against Iran. Oh, the only people that would benefit from that would be the Israelis and the Saudis. And I think if I was looking at a counterintelligence uh, operation to decide where this information com came from, I'd be very interested to see if I could find an Israeli hand or a Saudi hand. Because in the long run, Judge, both Israel and Saudi Arabia are much more dangerous enemies to the United States than the Iranians are. The Iranians are a third-rate uh, military power that we could handle very easily. But, you know, the, the Congress is crazy for war with Iran. Listen to Senator Graham and Senator McCain and Joe Lieberman. Um, they're owned by the Israelis. The Saudis are very influential. So when you look at these kind of things, you have to ask, who would benefit from the war? The Israelis and the Saudis would love to see our money and our young men and women being killed to fight their enemies in Iran. All right, you have engaged professionally in counterintelligence to, to enhance the, the security of the United States during much of, of your adult life. Tell me, Michael, could, could this be a case in which the American government, in which the Justice Department was played like a fiddle by foreign entities? It thought it was running the case, it thought it was in control of it, but in reality, these people that uh, that were involved were not under their control, but were under the control of someone who wanted to foment animosity between Iran and the United States. I, I don't think it's impossible, Judge. I, of course, don't have the information to say that. But when you when you look at when you look at the bottom line, who this benefits if it leads to military action against uh, Iran, it only benefits the Israelis and uh, and Saudi Arabia, and there's a precedent for it. We've already fought two wars against Iraq in favor of Israeli interests and Saudi interests. So we're always being pushed to, to get our people killed for their interests. So I think it could happen another time. Why not? Got it. Uh, Michael Scheuer, it's a pleasure, no matter how gloomy these things are that we talk about. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Judge. What we need to stand up and say is not only did they attack the U.S. in liberty, they... Okay. Well, that was, uh, I was told, that was like the interview that actually got Judge Politano uh, fired from uh, Fox. And uh, he was on Fox Business, of course. You know, how many people watch that uh, Fox Business? So. But they give you Sean Hannity and uh, Glenn Beck and uh, uh, the O'Reilly to spew nothing but lies. And uh, so people like that, the reason he got in trouble because his guest said that we did Iraq for Israel. Now that's something that you hear on this program. 
It's not something that's supposed to be on Fox. Now imagine if you hear that on Fox all the time. If you hear the guests that Fox Network put on, uh, puts on, talking about the war being for Israel and talking about the Israelis own our senators and own our foreign policy. Imagine how many of you would be in favor of that. How many of you, but that's, that is the real reality out there. Now, the perception that you have in your own mind that that country called Israel is friend with the United States. It is not. It is not. It's not a friend, it's a foe. But you don't know. Because the reality they bring you and drill in your head, the perception that becomes reality is they are friend that we need to support and protect and die for and send them all our money and have them control our commerce and have them control our politics and have them control everything to do with everything to do with foreign policy of the United States when it comes to the Middle East. Isn't it amazing to have Al-Qaeda with Ayman al Zawahiri? Where the heck does he make these videos out of? We can't figure that out? Of course we can. He probably does it out of San Diego there. Probably in the same Air Force base where we control these drones that go over Afghanistan killing little babies. The CIA is probably directing all these, just like they did with Osama bin Laden, directing Osama bin Laden, or whoever that was. That wasn't Osama bin Laden, actually. It was somebody that looked like him. And it's amazing, like you see these people in videos, and it's been like, what, 11 years? And it's like they don't age? No, I guess not. Anyway. Uh, that's the reality that we have in this country. Unfortunately, we are being lied to. We're being cheated. But yet, we go and vote. We go and vote. As if we have this, you know what? You are doing exactly what those young Muslim men do when they go and join groups that call themselves Al-Qaeda, you do exactly the same when you go into these ballot boxes and you vote for something that you think you're doing your civic duty. You see how things get complicated and complex that even your own mind cannot comprehend what is going on around you? Because you are busy with other things. The only thing you know about politics is when they put them on CNN, they line them up, they parade them on CNN, and you start being entertained by these candidates. It's just like you are, you don't know if you're watching a soap opera or if you are watching real reality. Because now you really don't know what you see on TV. Is what you see on TV real, or is it designed, or is it fiction? What is it? You have no idea, but you are enjoying it. That's exactly the same of how these kids actually join these groups to fight for something they think they're fighting for, and you go to the ballot boxes voting for somebody that the media drilled in your head. All you have to do is look at what the media is doing to Ron Paul. Whenever they mention him and his policies, they start laughing right away. Right away. It's like, well, what does Ron Paul think he's going to win? Why say things like that? Why say things like that? Or whenever they mention Ron Paul and his policies, or when he talks about the Federal Reserve Bank, they start laughing, and of course you believe them, and you pick up their attitude, and you don't know who the heck Ron Paul is. You know, Ron Paul was cheated out of votes in Maine. 
And we're going to show you a little report that actually proves to you that he was cheated in the main caucus. He could have, he could have won that. And how many other states are we really seeing the real Ron Paul? And just imagine if the media would allow you to see the real Ron Paul. But the media is playing the same, the powers that, that, that be, playing the same game they played last year or last election. They're going to put somebody who cannot win. Now, I guarantee you, Mitt Romney, this country is not ready. You know, even if he's the best, this country is not ready to turn over its power to a Mormon. They're not. They're not going to do it. Just for that, just because he's Mormon, they're not going to do it. You know, I don't know how John Kennedy actually slipped through, because he's Catholic. Rick Santorum? He's not. Gingrich? You know he's not. Ron Paul? You don't know much about him. And therefore, you are going to vote probably for the win that is being picked by the GOP. But like I said, in, in the uh, convention, but like I said, if Ron Paul is not on that ticket, forget it. And I hope he's not going to be a vice president. I hope he will not accept a vice president slot because he will, he would have had defeated everything that he's been trying to do. He would have, it's, it's better for him to shoot himself than go on the ticket as a vice president. If Ron Paul is not the president, if he's not the nominee, which, well, you do the numbers, but I think his message is out there, and he's very popular with the young people, the educated people, he's very popular with them. Why? Because they can get his program, his ideas. They know what it is. Let's show you how he, in Maine, uh, he was cheated of some votes. He actually won Maine, but they gave it to Mitt Romney. The headlines this weekend, Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney is back on track after winning the Maine caucuses. What the headlines haven't told you is that what happened in Maine is the messiest caucus Republicans have had so far, and it may not be over just yet. So was there rampant voter fraud in Maine? Then it is investigating a reality check that you won't see anywhere else. Maine is not a major state during the national primaries. Only 24 or so delegates come out of Maine to the convention. But what happened there over the weekend does more than just raise eyebrows. It is enough to make you question, was the caucus fixed? Saturday night, February 11th, the head of the Maine GOP, Charlie Webster, announced that Governor Mitt Romney won the Maine caucus by a slim margin. Official totals read that Romney barely won the caucus by less than 200 votes. The only problem? The governor was declared the winner with only 84% of precincts counted. Two counties, Washington County and Hancock County, had not held their caucuses. In Hancock, county Republicans had decided to hold their caucus this Saturday, February 18th. In Washington County, though, the state canceled the caucus because of snow concerns. Turns out the area only got a light dusting. Now, the problem here, Mr. Webster says even when those caucuses are held this Saturday, the votes won't count. I talked with him on the phone. On February 11th, that was election day. Our rules said this is when you're going to have to vote by this date. Um, you know, if you're out of town that day, you don't get your vote counted. I'll let the people, the caucus, the, the caucuses will be held. The state committee, our governing body, will have to decide if we want to expand that. You heard right. The head of the GOP in Maine saying that the caucuses will be held this weekend, and even though party officials were the ones who canceled the caucus in Washington County, they will not count the votes of those who turn out because they missed the February 11th deadline. And if the party decides to count those votes, well, they won't make that decision until the second week of March after Super Tuesday.
Well, that alone has caused a huge blow up across Maine. The state Senate president, Kevin Ray, says that, quote, our votes in Washington County must count as much as votes cast anywhere else, end quote. And Mr. Webster says it doesn't matter if the votes are counted because really it's just a straw poll. And he is correct that it is a straw poll and that the delegates are not bound to any candidate, meaning the delegates can vote in the convention for whomever they choose. But if you want to disregard the straw poll, don't hold one in the first place. But aside from the state GOP not wanting to include Washington County, there is another major issue from these main caucuses. Even though Governor Romney was already declared the winner, the numbers that the state GOP in Maine are reporting are, according to caucus chairman, incorrect. Take, for instance, Waldo County, where voters from 18 towns gathered for municipal caucuses in a countywide event. A total of 138 votes were cast. In the official Maine GOP tallies, however, the results from all but one of those communities, all but one, were given as a series of zeros below the name of each candidate, meaning the official tally shows that no one voted. The town of Belfast was one of 10 towns that held a joint caucus on the same day. That caucus was held on February 4th. I talked with Matt McDonald, a pastor of a small community. Okay. So in Maine, you know, the GOP leadership decided to cancel election in some counties. They call them counties in all other states. We call them parishes here. So they decided to cancel it, but yet they're postponing until next week, but they're saying that if you did not do it on the 11th, well, it doesn't count. The reason is those counties that were canceled, uh, uh, the, the votes were canceled in, and you know we did not want to go through with, the, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with that report because of uh, time constraints here. The problem is those, most of these people voted for Ron Paul. It was a Ron Paul county, and if they would have counted it, and if they did not cancel it, Ron Paul would have won Maine. But they did it so Romney. You talk about fixing? Now, now we know garbage does take place in politics. It takes place in politics everywhere. Cheating and fixing takes place everywhere. But that's not a democracy. That is not a democracy. I don't know what you want to call it. But again, Ron Paul, everybody's scared of Ron Paul because Ron Paul has some ideas. You know, one of the things that you see in Ron Paul's um, gatherings and his rallies is he's on this kick to abolish the Federal Reserve Bank. Imagine, how many of you know anything about the Federal Reserve Bank? You know, we're going to hear uh, Ron Paul's brother, actually, tell us a little bit about the Federal Reserve Bank. Maybe you will understand more and more of what the Federal Reserve Bank is all about and why Ron Paul actually wants to abolish that and bring, by the way, the Constitution, everybody talks about the Constitution, the Constitution says that only people can issue money, currency. Now when we say people in the United States, that's their representatives, which is Congress can issue money, not a private entity like the Federal Reserve Bank and sell it to the United States Treasury at interest. Let's hear the brother of Ron Paul. While at the In the Fed rally outside the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas, Texas, we spoke with Ron Paul's brother, Wayne Paul. 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed for the House where three members of Congress were on the floor. At that time, they only needed a majority of votes to pass it. So in 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed. 20 years later, 1933, under Roosevelt, the United States was declared bankrupt. And in 1933, the Federal Reserve Private Bank says, okay, USA, what are you going to pledge as collateral on the debt you owe me? 
What happened by 1936, does anybody know? We instituted social security system and you and I and our children and our children's children were pledged as collateral on the debt of our government to the Federal Reserve. And that's where we're at today. It took 20 years to make this country bankrupt and since then our government has operated under emergency powers of our government. It is not the president that makes the decision in this country. It's the Secretary of Treasury who turns around and is put in there by the Federal Reserve to manage the bankruptcy. We've been in bankruptcy ever since. So to print $700 billion and to give it away, how do they get away with it? The manager of the bankruptcy is told by the Federal Reserve this is the way to go. That's where we're at today. Yes, we should point out, Congressman Ron Paul now has a huge amount of sponsors for a bill in the House of Representatives to abolish the private Federal Reserve crime syndicate. In 1913, the money power of the country was taken away from the people by constitutional privilege it belongs with the Congress, but it was given up in the Federal Reserve Act. The Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express, but yet it has the power to determine the direction of use of money in our economy. If we could take that power back and put the Federal Reserve under Treasury, we start to be in a position <coughs> of being able to control monetary policy on behalf of the United States people. The Federal Reserve is totally private, and Alan Greenspan two weeks ago on PBS on Later News Hour said on record that they are above the law, the Congress, the President, everyone. No court can do anything. We run America. What is the uh, proper relationship, what should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a President of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. So long as that is in place and there is no evidence that the administration or the Congress or anybody else is uh, requesting that we do things other than what we think is the appropriate thing, then what the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. Notice what Greenspan is saying. Greenspan is saying the Federal Reserve is beyond the law. And in reality, they are in practice beyond the law. Nobody, as far as I know, has ever audited the Federal Reserve. One of the first things we ought to do when we nationalize the Fed is go in there and find out the audit. Who stole money? Who engaged in corruption? There's a whole series of people going back to Volcker, to Greenspan, to Bernanke, uh, and so forth. Okay. Greenspan, Bernanke, all of them, all the head of the Federal Reserve Bank, what are they? Research them, find out what they are. Where do they come from? Who do they answer to? It's not a coincidence, nor it's an accident that most of these heads for the Federal Reserve Bank come from a particular group of people around the country. Just like you saw, the Federal Reserve Bank, the President of the United States cannot interfere in their decisions. Nobody. It is a government within a government. It is a, an independent entity with no checks or balances or any strings attached to anybody or any body of politics or branch of government, period. They are on their own, and they do control what we do. Anyway. That's very much what we have for you, and uh, all we have time to say is uh, actually good night. Go do the right thing, and we are going to see you next Thursday. But I see a guy sitting here who don't want to come and uh, uh, get up here. 
And uh, why don't you come? He doesn't want to. Uh, what can I say? Um, we should turn the camera on him, but it's too late. We only have 10 seconds. And, well, come on. Now he decides. You better hurry up. Okay, well, he made his presence. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>